Welcome to today's SadoCon Saturday. <clears throat> so, moving forward with our training drills of one-step type attacks, we're going to start, and this will be a series over the next few weeks, of how to interpret our kata. Now, kata were originally designed by taking a fighting movement and then chaining it together with other fighting movements to create a, a sort of dance, if you will, as a memory template or a learning mnemonic to train the body to move in certain ways using those fighting defensive moves. So the fighting move came first and then was chained into a sequence. Even today in American Kenpo, the forms are created by taking the fighting movement first and then connecting it to another fighting movement and another and another in sequence. So understanding kata means going back to find out what was that original fighting move. Well, we weren't there when it was created, so we don't know. I was not there 400 years ago. I doubt very many of you were either when Seisan was created, or Kusanku, or Pasai. So we don't know what the original individual move was that was put then into a chain of, of movements or a sequence of movements, which we now know as kata. So how do we practice using that kata for self-defense. First of all, let's debunk a myth. Kata is not an imaginary fight against multiple opponents. As I said, it was a single defensive movement and then another single defensive movement and it basically identified that particular fighting master's um, style or, or techniques and they were put together to say, these are the techniques of how this guy tended to win his combative scenarios or his street fights, if you will. So we have kata. The first template I want to give you for analyzing, the word for analysis in Japanese is bunkai. So there's a lot of emphasis in the last generation, my generation, last half of my life, of understanding what do the kata movements mean. Okay, so again, myth number one, it's not multiple opponents, it's individual sequence of encounters. But the first rule I want to give you is the concept of universality versus uniqueness. Now, everybody wants to be unique. And when somebody starts karate, they say, my style is different because we do such and such. But I want to start the other way. And let's look at what's universal. Universality means what do we all have in common? Well, the first rule is arms only bend a certain way. Wrists only bend a certain direction. They may bend further or less based on your range of motion or your particular muscular flexibility or hip structure or whatever, but they still move in essentially the same direction as every other human since Adam and Eve. So we know that is universal. There's an old saying that says there are many paths up the mountain, but the summit is the same for everyone. If we start looking at what we have in common with other combative systems, we can understand, and even other karate styles, we can understand our kata and analyze it a little more accurately, I think. Because, again, human bodies haven't changed all that much. So, that's the first rule, is look universally. Let's look at a few specific movements as examples of what I'm talking about. Um, I had my kids go into wrestling at an early age, and one of the first throws that their wrestling coach wanted to teach them was a head and arm throw. You come around the guy's head and you twist and you put your hip in the way and you throw it. As a training tool to help the kids understand how to perform that throw, literally, and this is a coach who had no karate experience. I talked to him, I knew who he was, he was interested in my karate. He didn't know jack about karate, but he wanted to teach these kids how to throw make that movement. So here's what he had them do. He said, okay, I want you to spread your feet a little extra wide and kind of bend down a little bit. Then you're going to put your hands on your hips and as hard as you can, twist, and then go the other way and twist. And he had them drill twisting so that when they got over the head and arm and under the lat in with their fingers in the armpit around the guy's head, they can twist and make that throw. Well, anybody who's seen karate for any amount of time or studied will recognize pinyan sanda. Now, in the common interpretations, and a lot was lost when Okinawan karate went to Japan, 
and it, the kata were altered for the Japanese, and the interpretations were not taught, and they focused more on the hitting and kicking, and they lost the throwing, and then the Okinawans didn't want to teach the Americans because they were the conquering nation. Master Toma particularly had went and asked Uehara, his teacher, for permission to teach the gaijin, the foreigners, and so there was a reticence to pass it on. And even those teachers who had military contracts um, during World War II and beyond where they would teach the American occupying forces for a paycheck didn't often really teach the depths of Okinawan karate because it was proprietary and there's a lot of cultural understanding required to understand karate that they didn't think the foreign invaders were capable of. Anyway, over the course of the last century, a lot of the meanings of kata were lost or not taught, and even to the point that on Okinawa, a lot of them are not taught. But if we look at the universality, again, at the combative arts of different styles, judo, wrestling, penjak, silax, uh, uh, Mongolian wrestling, boxing, uh, boxe francaise savate, uh, what any art, okay, kung tao from India, they all, we all move the same way. And so when I saw this wrestling coach teach that, that was a clue to me, okay? That there is a universality to combat. Now, in judo, we have a, a whole bunch of throws where I reach over the opponent, set my hip in place, and drive with a rotation to, to make that throw. In judo, they will change the name of the throw entirely based on whether I'm just around the head whether I'm around the head and grab under the lat, whether I'm around the head and grab the belt, but the essential movement is here. So within that rotation of pinyan sandan, we have dozens of throws that you can see in any judo competition or in any judo manual or pictograph or instruction. We have all of those throws encompassed in that movement. Even at the end of pinyan sandan, where we come forward and we've thrown our punch and then we step around and the elbow hooks, I'll do it this way, I come around and the elbow hooks and hooks. Well, there I am, coming around the head. I've punched or I've come forward and grabbed, now I turn and pull him in and I throw. Or I throw and I may need to sweep before I do the next throw. Or I may throw him and then elbow him when he goes down. But all of those interpretations are found in other combative martial systems in other combat sports and fighting styles are all found in Pinyan Sanda. Another of my favorites is the U punch. Now we see it in, in our Pasai, we see it this way. In Pasai Show, we see it here. In several Jean-Claude Van Damme movies, because he was a Shotokan practitioner originally, they do this U punch movement also, and Van Damme will come in and throw that double punch this way. I'm not saying it couldn't be a double punch, but I'm a big sumo fan, and I see sumo wrestlers all the time locked up, leaning in and holding this position where I've got his belt, his mawashi, either around the front or in the back or over the head or over the shoulder, or I grab the belt and I'm trying to turn it. Sumo. If you watch sumo, you can see dozens of possible ways to affect a throw by coming from this position and twisting or coming back and out onto the other side. So sumo gives us a clue into pasai or pasai show in this case, okay? Another of my favorites is in our goji shiho kata where we pull this leg up. Well, it's been interpreted and created now because of the move towards striking only and we've lost the throwing aspect a lot of places in karate. And there are even Okinawan karate styles. Our own source system, Seibukan, which is the source of our kata in Seidokan, pretty much teach only the atemi, only the striking. There's not any of the joint locking and throwing, hardly, as taught currently in the Seibukan system. And we've had that discussion with many of our cousins from that style. But as a result, this move has become a throw and then I kick this guy instead of the pulling and lifting. Look at judo, one particular move, uchimata. 
very common throw. But I'm taking the opponent, coming up under his um, armpit with this hand while I pull down on the wrist or gi sleeve with this hand, and then I get my leg inside him and I lift. In wrestling, we call this an elevator. And we use it even when we're laying on our backs to use our leg to lift to get the guy to move or, or shift him. My leg is used to lift my opponent up one way while I pull down the other way. And it's not only uchimata, there are a variety of throws, so uchigari and others that can benefit from the lifting of that leg to kick his feet out from under him, helping me with the kuzushi or the imbalancing movement that allows me to make that throw. It's also noted that Goju Shiho, for example, comes from drunken style Kung Fu. So if we want to understand the falling forward movements and the, the body weight changes of Goju Shiho, maybe go look at some drunken style Kung Fu and see what's contained therein to give us an explanation of why I'm holding my sake on the, on the dish before I start the kata. Oh, I'm drunk, okay? And these kinds of throws where I'm using my body balance to throw my opponent over. So I look at other combatives, there's a universality. We see the same thing in Pasai, where we come forward and pull and kick. Now, yes, I can pull on the guy and kick him, but if you've ever tried that, your kick only extends about that far. I can't really get it all the way out because bodies aren't that long. So that kick really is better done to the lower limb to get his leg again out from under him and enable me then to throw and, and create that imbalance that helps me throw. So first clue in looking at your kata, not just for throws, I use those because those are some common examples that I see from sumo to American wrestling and so forth, and drunken kung fu. But if you, if you look at other combative styles, even in boxing, in seisan, we block, punch, punch, a one-two, okay, boxing, a one-two. If we look at other styles outside our own first and see how combat really occurs against a resisting, non-compliant opponent, we'll see a little bit better application. Lastly, Jesse M. Camp talks about his brother Oliver, who's an MMA fighter. Jesse M. Camp, by the way, for those who don't know, it goes by the Karate Nerd. He has lots of video vlogs and stuff you can look up online. But he talks about when you watch his brother fight in MMA, it doesn't look like karate. But when you take a picture freeze frame, you'll see him in a stance all the time. So when we're looking at stances, as I discussed earlier, in, a, in an earlier vlog, stances tell us about body weight distribution. And that's universal, okay? My weight is either forward and on balance or forward and off balance. My weight is either centered, whether it's mabu kibachi, mabu in Chinese. My weight is either centered, shifted, back, shifted back, upright. There are certain postures that when you take a picture of an MMA fighter, You'll see that freeze frame there in a karate stance. So first clue of understanding kata, look to the broader world of combat outside our own system so we don't get thinking in that small, win narrow window. Don't look through a porthole when there's a picture window available for the vista, okay? That'll help you a lot. That's key number one to understanding movements in bunkai and kata. Look at real combat and how the human body has fought for centuries, and you'll get a lot of clues. Until next Saturday, when we continue more ideas or templates for seeing how kata movements are applicable, thank you for joining, keep practicing.